Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for being at reInvent. And thank you, of course, especially for attending the session and being here with us. And it's really good to see all your faces here. Imagine for a moment that you're being asked to get cloud ready so that it's open for business, whether that's by a business leader within your organization or a technology leader, or even you as somebody who is responsible for it. Or perhaps you're involved in some way in getting that up and running. I know a few years ago I had a customer ask me, how do I get my environment set up? What accounts do I need to create? And I was confused. And we spent this time trying to figure out what it takes. We put multi-account strategy in place, landing zone, control tower. And the thing that we started to come to is customers need to have a foundation in place. Much like trying to build a house or a building, you don't really care about the foundation unless something goes wrong. Or the plumbing or the electrical. Imagine your house, you can only plug in one appliance at a time, and if you turn on a light, everything breaks. This is the stuff that we need, that we don't spend a lot of time worrying about until something goes wrong. That's the idea behind Cloud Foundations, is what are the things that we need to have in place that without them we can't realize the business outcomes or the reasons we're using the cloud to begin with. Living in your house, you're not there to think the plumbing is amazing. You're there to live, to host people, to enjoy your life there. My name is Sam Elmalak. I lead an initiative called Cloud Foundations within our solutions organization. I'm joined here by Alex Torres, who's a senior SA on that team, as well as Deepankar Biswas, who was part of the team that led the cloud transformation for EBSCO. And my hope is by the end of this talk, we'll give you a way and a mechanism to think about and execute on getting your foundation established so you can enable the broader business goals and other teams within your organization. And it is a journey. It takes time. There's things that we do iteratively. And just like everything that we need, whatever journey we take on, we need that foundation. Our customers are typically using AWS just like when you're using a house to make a difference, deliver products and services. Even if you're a nonprofit or an institutional or an institution that educates people, you need it to achieve that outcome but also want to make sure it's secure, compliant, meets what I need. And as a business, I might adopt it because I want to grow revenue organically, get business insights, operate, reduce the risk to what I am doing. And one thing I want to emphasize is the idea of operating my workloads. The cloud is amazing. I can take a credit card, spin up an environment, have servers available everywhere in the world within minutes. But what happens when something goes wrong? Or how do I get that environment up and running, reducing my risk and meeting my security and governance goals? And oftentimes, we see customers coming into the cloud and making use of it to migrate a workload. Or maybe it's to back up their environments. Sometimes customers choose to modernize things. That might be part of the journey, or that's where they start a new workload that way or use SaaS, software as a service. Some of you probably are using SaaS. And finally, develop native applications. Regardless of how you're using the cloud and whether you're doing any of these things or you're on the journey, we ultimately need to have that foundation in place. And keep in mind, not every customer will go through this journey from the bottom to the top. At times, you might start because I need a specific workload. Or I'm hosting a new type of application that I need. I'm going to put it in the cloud instead of investing in a data center. But how do we make sure that that's secure, meets our governance requirements, having that right foundation, that electrical, that plumbing? So we started to define this model that we've called Cloud Foundations. And the idea behind it is what are the capabilities that you need to have in place to open your cloud for business so you can deploy operate and govern your workloads. 
whether they are development environments or production. And how do we make sure that we do that in a methodical way that helps us not forget some steps, helps us get to an outcome that meets that need? And stepping a bit into that, it doesn't just take technology. It isn't simply deploying a piece of software and saying, yep, I'm ready to go. All the people and process that you might have to deal with, and for those of you that have been doing this for some time, you might have found situations where you couldn't move forward because the people weren't ready or the processes weren't there in place to make that happen. So how do we enable our customers, or your own customers within your own organizations, to make those changes and make that stuff happen? What skill sets do they need to have? What training courses might they need? And how do we get them to have the right processes, the technology, and things around it? And as we think through the way customers make change. As we think through how I'm updating my products or my offerings, generally we start out with a small frequency of change. As we move more and more toward modernization, perhaps we're moving toward DevOps. I will not define DevOps in this context, however that means to you. But as you move more toward automation, you start doing that. As you feel more and more confident in your controls and what you have, you're able to move workloads meaningfully. So by having the right foundation and the right approach, it enables you to have that agility, the velocity that you need to get workloads out. We've had some customers come in and say, my business leaders have asked us to go use the cloud. But I'm having a hard time convincing them I need to put these things in place. So building that reliability in and making sure that it's efficient and manage the risk that's associated with it. So we've put together this idea of cloud foundations to help our customers and ourselves have a methodical way of doing this. The idea behind it is provide you a guided path that includes the processes, the people that you need, the technology components to deploy, operate, and govern those production workloads. And we've come to also realize is to achieve this outcome, and many of you probably know it, You've got a lot of decisions to make. And they go beyond using your credit card and swiping or signing an initial contract. It's probably hundreds of decisions that you need to make across a number of offerings, whether they're from AWS or from a partner or things you have natively on premise. And sometimes those decisions have ripple effects that might come down the line. If I chose the wrong network topology, I'm going to have a hard time growing. If I chose to use VPC peering, for example, and this isn't saying VPC peering is bad, but if I chose to use it, I might be limited to only 250 things. So being able to have those decisions and have somewhere that you can go to to get that information to help you move forward and not have to worry about the impact of those decisions down the line because someone else has gone in and did that research. So we've gone in and said, what is the collective experience that we have as AWS? helping customers do this, to put together the best-in-class guidance to help our customers establish that. And oftentimes, you have to go through so many of these things that you need to do. Everything from access management to monitoring to incident response, configuration management. And oftentimes, it's the stuff that many people consider boring. I know for some of us here, this is stuff that we work in, and it's quite exciting, and it's fun. And for those of you that didn't realize, some people do think that stuff is boring. They just want to get the workload out. So how do we make it so that we can achieve those outcomes? So we've come up with this capabilities model. Turns out that we ended up coming up with 30. It was never the plan, just a nice even number. And these are capabilities that our customers need to have. When you start out, you might not need all 30. But as you move forward and grow within that process, you can start implementing this stuff in place. And if you notice, none of these are service names. These are things that we need to have in place to enable ourselves and our customers to be able to meaningfully deploy, operate, and govern things in the cloud. And each capability includes the stakeholders. So for example, I need my networking team and my security team there so that it can help you drive. For some of our customers, it helps them drive the conversations internally. 
and plan programs things and around it to make that happen. So diving into the areas that we have here defined and starting with infrastructure, here are the capabilities that can help you enable and design and build that cloud environment that will allow you to deploy those workloads at scale by bringing, for example, your networking into your workload development. Because when we're actually developing and creating workloads on the cloud, network is something that needs to be brought up because most of the workloads are network aware. When we move to the security area, we want to make sure that these capabilities that you have in place allow you to make sure that your environment is secure, that your identity is set in place, that you are following the latest best practices. So like we all know, security is always day zero, so we need to be on top of that. And moving on as well, resilience is always critical. It affects the quality of the services that your users get, right? So we need to make sure that these capabilities enable you to have a plan, to define a strategy, so you can continue to operate your environment as if nothing had happened in a time of crisis or during an, in an efficient time. Moving on to the, uh, the finance piece, we all care to make sure that all our workloads are well optimized, that we're not overspending. We need to make sure where we're spending uh, those budgets. So these capabilities that we're putting here together are there to help you gain that visibility, those insights, and make sure that everything in your environment is put together and that you can leverage other capabilities to create that visibility across. The operations uh, capabilities are meant to enable your developers. We want to make sure that they have a seamlessly experience when they're building and deploying onto the cloud. So your operations team can make sure that all the infrastructure is ready, that all the developers have everything they need, and you are in control of the change and everything that needs to happen so you can scale. And last but not least, the governance, risk management, and compliance. These capabilities are meant there to help you define and document how you are going to operate the environment. What needs to happen? What are your goals? Where are you going to be? What regions are you going to be using, for example? What is your risk appetite? And it helps you establish mechanisms to ensure that you're adhering to those policies that you're setting up. So we keep talking about capabilities. And so what's actually one of the capabilities that we have here, right? A capability, we define it as a component of your cloud environment. And the way that we're building them, it's it encapsulating a definition that tells you what needs to be done at a high level, a collection of use cases or scenarios that can walk you through that what and why it needs to be built in an environment. And we also have guidance. And this guidance is supposed to explain, expand a little bit on the what and the why from a cloud agnostic perspective and how to actually do it, how to build it. And we want to make sure that all of these things are comprised to help you achieve a business outcome. What do you want to get out when you establish this capability? Right. So when you think about that, the scenarios are just that. It's a checklist, a high-level list of topics that you can use to like, make sure where you are. And we'll dive in an example in just a little bit so you can see what I'm talking about. That general guidance is what I was talking through, that it's cloud agnostic, meaning to explain what needs to be done and why on a cloud environment. And then following that generic guidance, we have the AWS prescriptive recommendation. What services needs to be used, how, and why. So you can build that cloud foundation so you can deploy, operate, and govern your workloads. And all of these recommendations do not only come with how to put the service together, right? We want to make sure that we give you the people aspect. What are the training that we recommend and the skill sets that might be needed to run one or more of the capabilities together? What processes, what run books do you need? What is the set of steps like to add a new subnet or a new IP range? Like, how do you want to do that? And as you progress, the capabilities are meant to adapt with you through your journey. At the very beginning, the steps may be manual as you get familiar with how to do things, and those run books can eventually be automated. 
And last, we want to give you that technology piece again, the AWS service baseline, what partners do we have that can help you achieve that outcome, and what are the best practices that we have aggregated after working with thousands of customers. So let me dive into that example. And I just pick networking because it's somebody that we really have to do, right? So the networking capability is meant to help you implement a highly available and a scalable network on AWS. Here we have these scenarios within the capability that are high-level topics. And as you can see, there's no service names. It's basically, you need to establish connectivity within the cloud, how your workloads are going to talk to each other, how you do manage your IP addresses. Do you have an on-prem environment that you need to connect? Or do you have other environments that are outside the current one? How do you build that hybrid connectivity? And what you see here to the left are the IDs. Each of the scenarios comes with an ID, because the way that we want to build this is in order for, for you to customize your journey, you might be able to identify each of the scenarios that you need to accomplish, and you can build your own path. You can say, oh, I need to get down this, or this I already have it done. So it can help you with traceability later. So moving to that general guidance, each of the scenarios will come with a set of generic recommendation that will walk you through what I was just talking. How do you plan understanding what ciders do you want to use for certain places, what is the IP utilization, understand how to configure your network, how to manage it at scale, and having all of those, like maybe you're just starting and you have to set up that hybrid connectivity and you start connecting through the internet. And as your requirements evolve, or maybe you have other type of requirements, you might need to connect through a VPN or set up a VGP. And then how do you connect your workloads on the cloud within the same platform or other platforms? And from this, we want to bridge that to become AWS specific. And in that guidance, we'll walk you through why and how to set up a networking account, set up the right access for your cloud administrators, and make a decision. Maybe you want to use centralized uh, networking. So how do you use Cloud WAN? How to set it up? Or how do you use AWS Transit Gateway if you have a more complex environment and more routing scenarios that having a managed service do it for you? How to share those attachments? How to make sure that all the routes are kind of uh, spread all your, over your network? And how to use the IP address management system to ensure that you don't have overlapping IP addresses? And additionally, for all of these things, we want to give you the right runbooks that have the step-by-step -step guidance that you need to follow to operate it. And eventually, what I said earlier, you can automate these things. And last but not least, those extra resources. Training that accompanies each of the capabilities, or each of the collection of capabilities. What papers that are relevant for the outcome that you're trying to achieve. And reference architectures that you can use to implement this. Additionally, through the, through the guidance, whether it is cloud agnostic or AWS specific, we'll make sure that we link to the relevant AWS documentation at the right place so you can find exactly how to put something together. And if you are interested in having a customized like staffing recommendation or what skill sets need to be something, you can always reach out to us and we can work with you to help you put a plan together. And like what Sam was saying, we're not only off, like we're not only the capabilities not only included dice, but they also come with that functional area that help to help you identify stakeholders. It's very important through your cloud journey that not only having the right technology and the right people, but having the stakeholders that need to be involved at the right time to make an important decision. That way, that when you are about to release a product, Three months later, either security or operations, the, the day prior launching, come and say, oh, we haven't reviewed this. We've all been there. <laughs> it's not fun. So how can we make sure that everybody's in the room when making the right, to make the right decision at the right, time, at the right time and everybody is involved? So here is a view of all the capabilities classified by that primary functional area. Here is basically we have like the security capabilities will be owned by somebody from the security team the finance capabilities, somebody from the finance team, central IT, et cetera. These uh, functional areas, you might call them differently, is kind of like at a high level what we've seen that most customers have. So 
feel free to change the names if you're going to use them or you can map to your own organization, but that's the idea. And not only the capabilities come with a primary functional area, they also come with a list of secondary functional areas. Because more, what I was saying, right, we want to make sure that all the right stakeholders are present. So we take it back to the example of the networking capability. The networking team will be the one owning the capability. They're going to implement it. They're going to maintain it. However, central IT and software engineering need to provide inputs. As we develop workloads in the cloud and they're network aware, you want to have your software engineering teams develop their workloads so they work with your overall network. And the different workloads can communicate with each other. And in a similar way, central IT is usually in charge of deploying the infrastructure across all the environments that you might have. So how can you work with them so the right tags are set up, so the right um, routing tables are configured so they can go ahead and deploy them for you if you need to do that, if you're part of the security, the networking team. So we've talked earlier as well, not only this, but we want to offer a guided path. So taking an example with the 30 capabilities, this is a sample path that we put together, following it from left to right, top to bottom. The first thing that you need to do is that governance capability. Where are you going to be operating? What regions are you going to make available? What controls do you need to put in place? Before you even do anything, if you, you need to make that documented, identify your needs, and have a mechanism to make sure that you can go back and check that those things are being followed. The next thing that you might think on is, well, if I can't access my environment, that is very little I can do. So let's set up that identity capability so the right people have the right access to the right environments. And from there on, set up a tagging strategy. Set up your network, your log storage, and so on. From left to right, the capabilities to the right side are more complex, are more advanced. They have more interdependencies. So you can make your journey and you can pick what you need based on those scenarios that we saw earlier. So let's assume for a second that you were just starting, right? And here, we're just creating that path. So what I was mentioning, right? Starting with governance, what regions are we going to use? What's my email address um, baseline? How am I going to build, like, what is the, how am I going to use the email addresses on my, for all my accounts. Who's going to have access to those? Do I create shared mailboxes? Do I create uh, different mailbox, different email addresses for each account? How do I give access to those? What regions am I enabling? What services are going to be allowed? And how do I make sure that all those things are being checked? What are my mechanisms? Who's going to make sure that I have all those assessment tools or those audit tools to make sure that I keep track of all of those things? And then the next thing, you start building that identity through federation. You put your tagging, build a tagging dictionary that gets input from all your teams. What tags do you need for security, for networking, for operations, for finance? Make sure that you build that, start building that network. You make a choice, centralize, decentralize. What is, what is the right option? And once you have that, keep building on. And then set up a log storage. Start sending all the audit trails there. You don't need them right now, but it's good to have all of that stored so you see what's happening and how it is going. And then, what's your workload isolation strategy? When are you creating those? When do you separate the workloads in their own environment? And once you have all of these things, it's very easy to start setting up your cloud financial management using the tax, using that observability that we're talking to. You can set up budgets. You can make sure that everything is allocated properly. And once you have this in place, then you continue your journey. Now you have a network, let's secure it. You have a log storage. Let's make sure that all the security logs go to that log storage so you can build logging dashboards. Now that you're deploying workloads, what's your disaster recovery strategy? How do you make sure that you have the right things in place, the right mechanisms to ensure that every time you do a backup, you can restore it? Or if there is a disaster, how do you make sure that you continue to offer service? Creating that strategy, creating that capability. And then what's the level of support? Or how are you going to be deploying the new workloads? Or how are you going to be enabling your developers? What tools do they need? What training do they need? What kind of environments are they going to be using? 
And using these capabilities together with the scenarios within each of them, establish your goals. Where are you today? Where do you want to be tomorrow? Where do you want to be three months from now? What do you want to do next year? Plan it. And you build your pro like that project plan. And having this, like high level, 30 steps, 30 capabilities, you can keep track of your progress. Where are you? Is there anything that needs to be improved? And you can just go back, check the best practices that we're publishing, and say, oh, well, I'm missing this. Oh, there's this new update. And using all of these, you can put, for example, a timeline. And again, this goes back to those 30 capabilities. And I know it's a little small, but let me zoom in for a second. As you can see here, right? You start at the very beginning, you align on the priorities, what's your action plan? You enable your teams, you enable your environment. What do they need to do? And then you start building the, the, everything that you will have to be using, you'll be using. And then you deploy some experiments, you get familiar with what you're doing, and then you deploy your workloads. And then you iterate, right? You identify weaknesses, strengths, make a plan to improve on those. And from here, as you can see, you have the, and somebody might start, you might start building the identity capability, establishing all those things. And from here, you move to do something else in parallel. It doesn't have to be, it's not just a sequential build. For example, you establish access, you set up your tags, and now that you have tags in place, you can use those tags to use identity and implement uh, attribute-based access control. Or you deploy your network and then you can secure it. Or what's the level of support that you need? Like, if something breaks, who's in charge of fixing it? Is it you? Is it the partner? Like, what's the path that somebody needs to follow? What logs need to be collected? Do you have anything you need to fix that problem? And once you do that, you could put like a sample Excel sheet. That's something that uh, you can use like as a kind of yeah, that is an example. <laughs> All the capabilities, what you're working on, who's the owner, is it completed, is it not? What kind of issues do you find? Who was working on this before? And that way, you can, what I was saying earlier, keep track. What issues have you found? If you, do you work with your account team to identify some of us that can help you, you can always reach out for help, so we can help you move forward. And that way, you can identify the di different areas you can work on. Next, I'm just going to hand it over to Dipankar. Uh, he's going to walk us through what he worked with in EBSCO to build their foundation. That's what it, it has allowed them to scale to the size that they're today. So thank you. Thank you, Alex and Sam. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dipankar from EBSCO. Can I have a show of hands how many people know about EBSCO? OK, I have my colleagues here. They know, and sure, a couple of. Well, you're going to know more now. Uh, well, who is EBSCO, right? We are a content aggregator of scholarly research. You know, we collect tons of you know, research materials from tens and thousands of distinguished publishers, and we sell subscriptions to it. As you can see, very diversified customer base, right? Libraries, uh, medical institutions, schools, and what it also tells us is a very difficult SLO expectation, right? SLA, SLO, SLIs. So yeah, um, we do sell a lot of premium content through bibliographic and research databases, you know, e-books, audiobooks, uh, evidence-driven clinical decision products. If you have been a university student prepping for your term paper, searching research articles, it's a high likelihood you have used EBSCO. Well, um, you know, besides all the accolades this organization has earned over the last, I think, 35 years in business, um, we also ventured into a new offering, uh, which is our managed cloud service. It's called ILS. Um, this is more about um, offering, you know, an open source platform, uh, a SaaS-based hosted solution. Uh, very proud to share our latest offering, uh, EBSCO Folio. Um, Library of Congress is our newest customer. It's a very exciting time to be working in this company. 
As like many of us who had a long run business, started from on-prem data centers, it's been a journey. Sam alluded to it. It's hard. It's all about carefully prioritizing work and managing risks. And of course, you don't thank a doctor when you are doing good until you're not. So of course, we evolved from printed journals to CD-ROMs to a full stack online presence. You know? And in that time, we have transformed ourselves into what is, at its core, a technology company. Today, we have a global customer base catering to billions of transactions each month, leveraging 90 plus AWS distinct services and solutions that are scattered across 100 plus AWS accounts in several regions. Of course, of late, our methodology has been more structured, informed by roadmaps, uh, informed by well-architected pillars uh, for best practices. And of course, we always inform our roadmap with also the seven hours of cloud migration strategies that helps us pick the right approach based on the workload type, time to market, complexity, and whatnot. As one can understand, coming from data centers and all, your solution really need to factor in you know, business continuity when it comes to like, how are you gonna support the migration, the transformation journey? What you're seeing here is an overly simplified pictorial view of, okay, services live in AWS, have dependencies back to on-prem, you know, private cloud uh, environment, we call it hybrid cloud across prem environments. And yeah, we had to pick our areas of investment. We invested heavily in highly redundant direct connect lines that affords us four nines of availability and really has paid us uh, high dividends with them. Of course, in AWS, our implementation makes some of the best practices that Cloud Foundation team, along with, you know, the, there's a lot of white papers and stuff that AWS uh, larger teams have published. What this shows you is separation of concerns, right? There are foundational OUs, there are workload OUs, there are workload supporting OUs with CI, CD pipelines and observability, and then there are additional miscellaneous OUs to take care of your account management and stuff. And of course, um, so yeah, Sam did ask me to share a story about, well, how easy is it for an organization to go all in in the cloud? And to be very honest, when we started our journey, uh, we met so many vendors who went to cloud and came back. The cost was prohibitive, or there were so many surprises. The key here is sustainability. How do you sustain? So five years back, um, well, one of our smallest business unit, uh, you know, they had great aspiration to look at how can we expedite the developer velocity? How can we expedite the time to market quotient? So we ventured into solutioning that in public cloud. It's a very small uh, solution, but from soup to nuts, in nine months from inception, we were hosting our first product. It's a clinical decision product, EBSCO Health, Dynamed. With that win, we started thinking about, can we now shift focus and go to a much more, you know, some of our core flagship products like EBSCO Host? Uh, for folks who do not know, it's not a Black Friday experience. Our average day searches are around 500 million a day. So it's, it's a very, very busy platform. We partnered with um, ProServe Mobilize. That's the team in AWS who helps us put together a roadmap, a migration readiness program. Uh, we built in you know, milestones and stuff, a lot of focus on you know, thoughtful precision on cutovers. Because we are not talking about an application of five services. We are talking about an ecosystem of 100 plus services, a lot of dependencies, monolith, not cloud native services. Uh, and of course, relational, stateful dependencies and all that. Uh, well, two and a half years down the line, last year, same time, we were successfully able to migrate, uh, you know, EBSCO host and a bunch of other related products to the cloud without a single customer facing disruption. So that was pretty good. And of course, into 2022 and beyond, our key areas of focus have been optimization for cost, governance, and of course, modernization of all the migrated workloads. 
the coming years, we are uh, greatly focusing on resiliency and sustainability, because those are the two key things that are gonna help us grow more in the cloud environment. So why cloud foundations? Oh, that's interesting. This is the reason. You start a cloud journey, and if you really need to sustain, well, this is just the beginning, right? So definitely, um, optimization and my, uh, modernization are the two key phases uh, that those have been like a key area of uh, you know, our interest. Um, in this slide, I'm gonna talk about some of our learnings because when we started the journey, we didn't have Sam and Alex. There wasn't a Cloud Foundation team. We learned, we dealt with so many learnings and we had to adapt. But then later on, now we retrospectively look back, look at all the guidance and best practice and documentation that's been put in, we can easily relate. Yeah, there are things we could have done differently, could have prioritized differently. Uh, but again, just echoing some of the good stuff uh, that we just saw here. So through our inception phase, working with the ProServe, we figured out, okay, we definitely need a least access privilege. Who doesn't want, right? You have to secure our environments uh, and all that, but there is a cost to it, right? And the only way you can get it done is infrastructure as code for all those supporting functions. Uh, in a coming slide, I'm gonna talk a little more about the details of, some of the details of what we were able to do there. We also saw, as we open the floodgates, new landing zone, shiny accounts, there was a flood of new services and applications coming in. Uh, and yeah, uh, we very soon started realizing, well, we're gonna need some adequate governance. How are we gonna manage those risks? So definitely, there's a category of things where we put in a few things, and I'm gonna speak to it in a minute. Um, as Sam alluded, right, fiscal predictability. Managing services in a data center with leased infrastructure, that cost is not real time. Until you are in the cloud where your decision's really gonna dictate the next wise move or not. So definitely, there are a lot of tools that can help you with it. Uh, of course, we did prioritize that one area where we figured out uh, how, we need, how we could do better and kind of be optimal in our presence. Just like applications need scalability, the account structures need them as well. Very soon, as we started running you know, tons of workloads into those new shiny, you know, uh, not control tower, but landing zone accounts, we started running into limits, right? NACL limits, API thresholds, whatnot. And that's where the multi-account strategy comes in to kind of help with you know, some of the scalable solutions and a much more modularized approach uh, to you know, how you can help yourself. This uh, picture is from the Cloud Foundation Framework. Uh, there are those six categories, and in my section, I'm gonna just speak briefly, like pick an example from each of the category and just share some of the stuff that has really worked for us in a good way, that is still working. Uh, one of them being our multi-account strategy, right? I mean, why? Why do this? Uh, well, you start hosting too many services in a same account, you lose granularity, you lose auditability, you lose accountability, right? So the first thing we can easily see is by workload isolation. And what's the I workload? It's, it's a variable thing. There is no prescriptive guidance on what has to be a workload. Whatever fits a modularized collection of logically related services, right? We are trying to localize the chatter because, yeah, it's costly. You will find out. It's just not even costly. That sub-millisecond that you want to really save matters how have you structured your accounts and how those accounts talk to each other. So definitely we are seeing a lot of gains with, and again, this is a, a implementation still in progress, so we have started, we know the benefits, a uh, lot of cost, you know, accountable cost model here because now we're gonna have smaller workloads and an accountable ownership uh, defined. Uh, decentralizing decision making, right? We don't want developers to worry about you know, all the supporting pipelines and logging and all that stuff. Well, we give them a well-baked account structure that has all the plumbing built in, and that helps with a lot of seamless integration. 
And of course, you do get the benefit of centralized policy control, which kind of helps you regulate and manage things more efficiently down the line. In the IM side of the house, um, that's a pretty interesting area. The top thing is the guidance coming from the Cloud Foundation team, right? And we don't have enough time to go through each, but what it's showing you is when you peel the onion, right? E each step is one more increased level of maturity. And on the rightmost area, you will see here, use infrastructure as code for all your policies and all, right? It's great to have, comes with a cost and right prioritization of work. Everyone must have it, but there are building blocks to get to and uh, you know, means to make things more repeatable. And of course, what we did here is very similar, where you know, we came up uh, with our needs. We, we built playbooks and runbooks uh, to support them. We leveraged the identity center for uh, facilitating federation. That's one key, key area, I'm gonna say, and that's so needed uh, to kind of be on top of you know, the long-term sustainability when it comes to risk governance. Uh, Multi-factor authentication, um, you know, um, the account vending uh, stuff, it's all done through um, Control Tower now, that's a newer solution. And of course, uh, we leverage uh, infrastructure as code to support all operations to maintain the least access privilege. The four other categories, uh, I've tried to jumble them together to kind of save on time and all. Um, operations, right? And I think some of this talks to where Sam went. In all these areas, I, I missed highlighting a key point. You really need a balanced investment between people, process, technology. And some of those categories rightly speak to each of them in varying levels of magnitude based on you know, what level of maturity your organization might be. So under the operations, this is where you know, definitely a bias for automation first approach, right? Oh, all automated CI, CD pipelines to deploy changes, support rollbacks, um, and support rollbacks could be tricky. Teams who have very tight availability budget Mean time to respond, yeah, you need emergency rollbacks. So sure, it's like you keep on maturing and optimizing stuff. GitOps pattern has been really uh, a good structure we have adopted uh, in the development practices, and that's really helped us in a good way. Um, the developer experience, what we are referring to here is the structured, consistent way for your development teams to code, build, validate, and deploy code. That is such a key area which helps with portability of resources across the organization. And of course, observability. There is a reactive side of our SDLC where, hey, there is a problem. How quickly can I get to the right signals or right signals telling me where the right problem is? And the proactive side where do, does my red metrics give me enough to kind of bake in improvements in my SDLC process? So definitely that operation side of the house taking care of some of them. Governance, um, it's very difficult to get the tagging strategy correct in the first go. That's what we have learned. We have redone our tagging strategy n number of times, but again, based on the next new learning we have. Now, happy to share, we definitely have very consistent tagging strategy, and definitely that has paved a way for more granular and you know, accountable visibility. Uh, it's also important how you're gonna contain and regulate this environment where who is stopping your developers to go and get all those new cool AWS uh, you know, made available services. Well, we have the architectural decision record system where you know, there's a lot of good quality gates baked in. Uh, you know, there could be a requirements uh, leading to a need for a new solution. Sure, um, go through the ADR process. We have architecture involved. We have uh, leadership involved. There is fiscal aspects that gets reviewed. And of course, um, the decision is uh, up made uh, to move forward. Business continuity, right? Uh, sustaining a two billion business, um, a two billion turnover business requires a lot of drills uh, and planning for high availability. Even if you are in a single region, there are a lot of good documentation on how to exercise multi-AZ within a single region. And we learned the hard way 
that even though some of the services are by default regional, like RDS or whatnot, it really comes down to the configuration on how the team has set it up. Some service could be regional, but if it's not configured correctly and a specific AZ has degradation, you're gonna feel the impact. So definitely a lot of failover drills, uh, capacity planning that has helped us stay uh, over. Uh, we have seasonal peaks as well, uh, just like college sessions. The week before Thanksgiving is our fall peak, and then you know uh, April mid is our spring peak. And of course, chaos engineering, that's an area that we are still trying to learn more. So we are partnering with AWS um, to execute some of our game day events. Uh, that's an area where you know, they have a nice framework uh, and we are still a little um, you know, learning uh, how to do that at scale. And then of course, the fiscal visibility, right? Um, that real-time visibility is a key, key area to kind of that helps you stay on the top of you know, um, how to govern, how to make decisions. Um, what we really found interesting is some of the fit for purpose spending plan. You know, you, you could be locked in in your RIs, but a key area we saw is tools that helps you manage your variable expense towards the cloud services. So definitely there's a lot of good flexible uh, things uh, out there in the spending plans that really has helped us a lot. So summarizing, as I said, you know, people, process, technology, those are the three areas where we made very conscious decisions uh, to help prioritize various aspects of solutions or tools that we're gonna bring in, uh, and we saw rewards. In people, uh, we have a very motivated workforce because they know the power of some of the managed solutions that they directly have access to, right? And that helps with that intrinsic uh, motivation. With process, we started with CCOE as our first uh, version, and then we matured into cloud enablement. That's the organization uh, we have, and we are you know, expanding with more capabilities and stuff. And of course, technology. The ability for our organization to have its development teams focus on differentiated work, that's the key. You know, what does business want? More customer visible features. That's why when Sam said it's hard, and I, I did echo, like, yeah. Like, how do you prioritize the next, uh, you know, platform stabilization, you know, solution, which is gonna change things or whatnot? Like, yeah, we have to sell the problem. And of course, uh, we, did, we do see now good dividends in terms of how the technology has really helped us here. Uh, do wanna echo, that this is a continuous improvement area, right? Few slides back, I talked about, hey, this is the beginning. Yeah, we, we are navigating a journey. Um, you know, we continue to adopt more cloud-native managed solutions, uh, improve governance through Trina's viable platform, uh, prioritizing work, managing risks, key, key area. So this is an area where your product management, your leader, techn technology leadership, your the whole ecosystem has to be in the loop um, and on the same page to help foster a more stable, coherent environment. And then of course, finally, we continue to partner with AWS and the Cloud Foundation team to pursue more mature levels of maturity you know, in our environment. With that said, I want to pass it back to Sam from the Cloud Foundation team. So how do you make use of all of this? You've heard a lot, you've seen a lot, and much of it is just telling you things in theory, what you need to apply, or how do you make use of it? Um, cloud enables your enterprise, obviously. You can go and make sure, make things that meet your business goals. How you establish that foundation matters. And just like we've heard, they spent a long time trying to get the tagging strategy right. Imagine from the very beginning, had you had a dictionary, that best practice that's available to you, you can make use of it, so you get the lessons learned from all of that. That's the whole point of forming the Cloud Foundations team and what you see today. So as of a few weeks ago, we've put a number of resources available. So the framework, the first link that you see, that's up as of Friday. We've got a white paper out where pretty much every diagram and everything that you've seen there is within that white paper. 
The other thing that we didn't mention during this presentation is part of the Cloud Foundation's team is actual code and solutions and implementations. So not only do you get the guidance and things, over time, we will build more and more automations and things in place that make it easier to establish a foundation. So for example, an instance schedule a solution that helps you make sure shutdown instances that aren't being used. All of these are things that we're putting together to make this easier for you. So by using the framework, using the white paper, using the solutions, we want to accelerate your time to being able to have that foundation established. For some of our customers that made use of the framework to go talk to their leadership and state, we need these things in place and convince their business side to invest in the foundation in order to achieve those meaningful goals. So your actions, should you choose to accept them, take a look at the framework, take a look at the white paper, take a look at the solutions that we have and navigate through them. Give us feedback. There's buttons there to provide feedback. We'd love to hear from you. Engage with your account team, professional services, partners, whoever you think you need. The framework might even help you make a decision to decide whether you want to build it yourself or find a partner or professional services or anyone to help you, or possibly do a managed service. Because in some cases, that is the right answer. And the last thing, we've built together a virtual track around this idea of cloud foundations and multi-account strategy. These are the sessions that are available throughout this reInvent that we recommend that you go to and join if this is a topic of interest. And you'll see things from architecture to implementation to discussion to actual hands-on. We ran a workshop earlier today. Um, but these are all available for you. And just go take a look at the information, material, give us feedback. And we're here to help you, or at least try to help you. Tell us if we're getting it wrong. Thank you all for being here. Really appreciate it. Please fill out the survey and give us your feedback. Thank you.